I'm going to start a new series today. Uh, it'll be a three-week series uh, that I've entitled Walk Worthy. <coughs> Walk Worthy. Uh, can I tell on my wife today? <coughs> Penny is so funny. I don't know if I should tell. I didn't tell you I was going to tell this. <coughs> it just came to mind. Paying attention how you walk. You know, I, I'm pigeon-toed. I, I know you're like, yeah, we know. But I've always been pigeon-toed, and just, just, this is the way I walk. But uh, some of you are, too. I've seen you. <laughs> the brotherhood. And so, uh, but my wife, the other day, I had a video of us in Japan, and she was looking at her, the video. She was, I walk like that? <laughs> I was like, I, that's, you walk it. I didn't make it up. And it was, it, it, she was bothered that her foot wasn't perfectly straight. It was like, I mean, I'm like, I have to look real close. I'm like, what are you talking about? But it bothered her so much that everywhere we went for a few days, she'd be like, how am I walking? <laughs> is, is my foot straight? <laughs> and I'd be, I'd be messing with her like, no, your foot's all crazy. I don't know what's going on. You look like a duck. No, <laughs> not true, not true. But I used to be so self-conscious of it when I was young, I'd be really careful to try to straighten my feet. And I rolled my feet. I still do it to the, now I just don't care. But I would try to, I was so self-conscious. You Everybody know what I'm talking about? And that you try so hard to make sure you're walking cool. Then you work so hard at walking cool, you can't hardly walk because you're tripping over everything. And I thought to myself, how great of a Christian would we be if we were concerned about our spiritual walk with the same intensity as we are our natural walk. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 through 2. It says, As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as the Father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. I'm focusing three weeks because of these three words that Paul used. He said, I exhorted, comforted, and charged you with the purpose of helping you learn to walk worthy of God. Now, it's important that we take a second to talk about this word worthy. It, it, we're not talking about if you walk really good, you clean up your life, all of a sudden God's going to like you. No, we're not talking about that. What the word worthy here is the word axios. And it means befitting or equal value to or corresponding with a thing. In other words, if you're going to be a Christian then act like a Christian. If you're going to be a child of God, then you ought to have some resemblance of God. My children, uh, whether you like it or not, they take after their parents. And not in every way. They're individuals. They have their own peculiarities and things like this and uniqueness. But they're still, if you, watch, if you hang out with my kids long enough, you're like, yep, that's Tracy's son. You just know what's going to happen. And uh, because there is a, there's, there's a congruity to, to, between them and me. There's, we connect. We walk together in this thing. And when the Bible says you walk worthy, it's saying that we ought to walk in a, such a way that we resemble the Father. That's a good thing. And so he says, I exhorted you, I comforted you, and I charged you in order to get you to watch how you walk. The word walk in the, in the Greek is the word peripateo. Makes you want to eat a potato. We ought to serve that at Easter. Peripateos. And peripateo means to progress or to make good use of opportunities. You know, this is an interesting thing. It's a sermon all by itself. Because so many people get so offended that someone else is so blessed. Well, maybe, just maybe, they're not really all that blessed. You had the same opportunities and uh, blessings as they had. The difference is they may have taken, uh, uh, taken advantage of the opportunity where you, ha you didn't take advantage of it. It's kind of the difference, if I can get over on this subject for a second, it's the difference between equity and equality. We live, this is a hot topic in our world right now, because some people in politics, they want there to be equity in society. But there is no equity in society. There can be equality, but not equity. Because equality means you have the same opportunities, but equity means you have the same outcomes. And when someone starts talking to you about equity, and especially in the workplace and everything else, just you got to remember this is a perverted deal because equity says we're going to make, make sure that we put a weight on somebody or elevate someone else so they can all have the same outcome, not taking into consideration the effort and labor that one person may have put out 
where the other person didn't put out. So one person wants to sit at home eating ice cream and playing video games all day. The other person wants to work their tail off, but they, because of equity, we have to promote one and, put, and suppress the other one to get the outcomes we want. But that is not righteous at all. Equality is righteous. We all have the same opportunity. Now, what are you going to do with it? And that's the word parapateo. What are you going to do when the opportunity comes? When the woman with the issue of blood heard that Jesus was coming down the street, she didn't sit on her couch going, well, it's just, you know, I've tried everything else. No, she said, here's an opportunity. Now, it may be hard to make it happen. I'm going to have to crawl through that crowd. If anybody sees me, I'm going to be in trouble because I'm not supposed to be in the crowd. But I have an opportunity, and if I could put some, some faith into my opportunity and put a little action in my opportunity, if I can walk this thing, then I can see a miracle in my life. <clears throat> so we're going to walk worthy. And so to walk in congruity, there is something that you have to understand. If we're going to be in this axios, befitting, or harmony uh, with God, there are several things that you have to get a rev revelation of to work in your life. Now, I'm trying to encourage you today. Turn to your neighbor and say, be encouraged. You smell funny, but be encouraged. Your hair's a mess, but be encouraged. You have to have a revelation of the enormous deposit the Father has made in your life. You're like, well, I don't understand that. Oh, deposit. What do you mean? What's, what's he done? What, what, what's he done? Well, if you don't understand the investment God made in you, you'll never understand what, what links he'll go to to make sure that you prosper. You ever work on a house, and when you work on that house, man, that house is more valuable to you. It may not be more valuable to anybody else, but when you have blood, sweat, and tears in something, that thing becomes valuable to you. It's a big deal. We had a Jeep, a 98 Grand Cherokee, that my oldest son was kind enough to destroy. <laughs> and uh, I loved that car. It had a billion miles on it. It was complete junk. If you got it on the freeway, you had to go downhill with a tailwind to get it up to speed. <laughs> but it had 299,950 miles on it. And all I wanted to do was drive it over that 300,000-mile mark. That's all. I told him, I said, listen, I, when it gets to 300,000, I'm driving it. So he wrecked it. <laughs> and I told Penny when he wrecked it, I said, now we've got to go buy another car that has 299,950 miles on it. But the car meant something to me. I, I, I took it down several times to see about trading it in. They'll give you $1,000 for it, this that kind of thing. And, and I always tell Penny, this, it's worth more than that to me. It means something to me. It was the first car Penny and I, when we got married in 1998, it was the first big purchase we had. Actually, the first thing we bought was a washing machine because apparently we get clothes dirty. And then the next thing I, we bought was a, this, this Grand Cherokee. <laughs> and so it meant something. It, it was it was, we got it when we got married. And so it almost kind of represented our whole family. When our kids couldn't sleep, we threw them in the Jeep and drove them around at 1 o'clock in the morning until they fell asleep. Or we just gave them a bit of drill or something like that. And so, <laughs> and so it didn't mean anything to anybody else. Anybody that drove that car would be just frustrated with this car. The lights didn't work. We drove it down to Ensenada, Mexico to go preach down there. And something went wrong with the lights and they never turned on again. So you had to phone on to see anything at night. The dash lights barely turned on. It was a mess of a car, and I loved it so much because it meant something to me. Now, you may look in your mirror and you think, what a mess of my life. I have gotten so many addictions and so many problems, and, and I keep messing up every relationship. I can't keep a job, and I can't walk this thing out. I have no joy. I'm full of depression. And you may think that you are flawed or you're battered and you're bruised, but you mean something to him. It doesn't matter what everyone else says. They may offer you $1,000 when you try to trade your life in. But God says, I cannot trade you in because you mean more than that to me. You, have, you are valuable to me because I've paid a high price for you. Blood, sweat, and tears have gone into your life in the form of Jesus Christ. You are not a small thing to God. He has invested his name. He has invested his blood. He has invested his equity into you.
The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption for you. Well, I just don't think I'm really that valuable. I just, and you know who you are when, in, when you, and ever, I think we've all been there at some point when we have such low self esteem. Nobody really wants us. Nobody likes us. And we, and, and to justify the, res, the, 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 uh, the results of that pain, we call ourselves introverts. It's not because we're really introverts, it's just that we don't want to deal with any more pain. And so we just lock it all up. Inside, we really want people to come to us and share life with us, but we're so afraid we're going to be rejected or hurt or whatever again, so we just put a label on ourselves, and I'm just an introvert. Now, some people are more extrovert than others. I get it. But God never called you to do this alone. And the only reason a person would try to do it alone is if they've so devalued themselves or devalued other people that they have separated themselves from humanity. And it's not God's desire for you at all. You are highly valued by God because of the investment he made in the form of the blood of Jesus. You are highly valued because of the emotional investment he made in you. The Bible says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Now that's the New King James. and the King James it says, that was not touched with the feelings of our infirmities. So here's this word, this terminology, who is not touched with the feelings, the emotions of our sicknesses or our weakness. And so Jesus had to be, he had to not only suffer physically, but he had to suffer emotionally to be a sacrifice for you. Come on, somebody. And so every time you start feeling, I just feel so low. I feel so, just, I don't know what's going on. I, and, and, and any, listen, any doctor out there will put a label on you. And it's okay, you know, they have to, they want to define it somehow. But don't let that end up on your calling card. If they say to you, oh, you're bipolar, that's fine. They can say what they want and they know how to, you can address it from there. But listen, don't lead with that. Here, my name's so and so and I'm bipolar. No. Just let that bipolar just drift from your vocabulary and say, this is what they say I am, but this is who God says I am, and I'm happy to help to work this way. If they have medicine, if that's the way God calls you, that's fine. I think there's a higher level. It's called faith, but that's okay. You're not in sin if you take some kind of medication or something. And so, but you don't, don't, don't let that be the place that you camp out. I mean, if your bank account, you ever get a phone call or an email from your bank that says that you, you have insufficient funds or something like that? Something happened. Maybe someone hacked your account because you never, it was never your fault. <clears throat> well, you don't just set it right, right then. You're like, well, that's it. That's it. I'm broke. Rest of my life, I guess I'm broke. No. You go, well, i got to solve this problem. And so you work an extra shift or you go rob the store or something. But <clears throat> you, 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 you figure out a way to get out of that identity of being broke. Then why would you accept an accusation from the enemy saying that you're sick? You're just going to roll over and say, well, they, they called and said I didn't have enough money. I guess I'll never have enough money. I might as well not work. Why try? That's crazy. And so the Bible says that he is touched with the feelings of our, our emotions of, of our infirmities, our sicknesses. And so we, but we're not going to roll over because we deal with infirmities and sicknesses. But we, and the main reason is because we have a Savior, a high priest, the Bible says, who can, who can, who can uh, understand or sympathize with our weaknesses, meaning that he's felt the way you have felt. So when you feel depressed, guess what? Jesus has felt depression. You mean Jesus was depressed? No, I'm saying he was temp tempted to be depressed. But listen, when your best friends turn to you, that can cause a lot of heartache emotionally. Jesus had it happen at least twice. And so he, he has felt what you have felt. He has been emotionally damaged like you have been. And so he can, he can connect with you because he has invested emotionally in your pain. Yeah. The third way he's invested in you is with his reputation. Now, it's important that you understand this. If you read your Bible, you're going to see this a lot. The Bible says he will do it for his namesake, not your namesake, for his namesake. 
I told my kids early on, I'm the pastor in this town. Don't embarrass me. I embarrass myself plenty already. I don't need any help. <clears throat> if you're going to do something crazy, do it in a different city. <laughs> Be a heathen in another city. No, I didn't tell them that. I didn't tell them that. <clears throat> but I said, I've worked too hard, and my wife and I, to make sure that we have a good reputation in this town because we don't want anything to get in the way. We're not perfect. I've made my wife, except for a weird walk, my wife... <laughs> <laughs> she's perfect <clears throat> but please don't drag my name through the mud please please don't put me in the paper you know because that, I, I want to keep my reputation too well you know that God if he calls you his child and the enemy rolls you guess what they're saying the enemy jacked one of God's children and for his own sake he says I'll show up and I'll do whatever I have to do because of my namesake. But that doesn't mean he will do it just because he's so great. You have to receive, you understand this, you have to receive the opportunities that we spoke about earlier walking this thing out. But God's desire for you is, to, is for, for you to carry his reputation with you. It is a great, valuable weapon. When I pray, I say, Father, for your namesake. Don't let your, your children walk around sick when they're young. I mean, it's one thing if you're 95 years old and you're ready to go and be with Jesus, and you're like, well, I feel weak. Well, you ought to feel weak. You're 100 billion years old. <laughs> maybe it's time you go. I don't know. Now, maybe you want to live to 120, and that's fine, too. But, <clears throat> but, but if someone's running around 30 years old or 20 years old, and they're just feeling some kind of ailment, I just say, Jesus, I thank you, Father. Your name is connected to your children. For your name's sake. Let the blood of Jesus and the, the Holy Ghost heal their body. Listen, it's okay to remind, the Bible says remind him of his word. Recall his word. And so he has invested his name into your life. Hebrews eleven six. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. Praise the Lord. The second reason that you have, that you need, to, or second revelation you have to have if you're going to walk this thing out, is you, you have to know that he knows you, for better or worse. <laughs> it's always funny, because <clears throat> uh, anyone dating, I'm talking about real dating, I'm not talking about shacking up, all right? I'm talking about normal, righteous dating. I feel like there's some confusion in here. <laughs> I, I'm just going to tell you my belief. My belief is, until you're married, you should not be living together. I'm just telling you what I think. Uh, maybe I'm just old. Or scriptural. But, um, <clears throat> but anybody dating can put it on just right to maintain that relationship. But when you get married, there's no hiding. You, you know how you go. When you get, you're going on a date, you get, man, you go take that bath and that shower, and you get all just right. You put on all the right cologne, all the right places. You go on that date, and you're in your proper manners. You tip well. You do everything you're supposed to do. But when you're married, you let your guard down because you can't be that good that long. <laughs> and odors. I mean, not my house, but most houses. <laughs> Attitudes. Bad habits. They're all evident. My wife knows me. Now, in some ways, that's embarrassing. But in some ways, it gives me so much confidence. I'm like, she's still with me now. We're good. We're good. She has seen everything. I mean, whatever I can do, she has seen. And so, God knows you. I want to read this. This is kind of long. But let me just read it. It's, it's uh, eight verses. This is Psalms 139, 1 through 8. Oh, Lord, you have searched me. I want you to listen really intensely to to, to, uh, to this, this text. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue 
but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me in behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. There's so much in this text. It is such a rich, rich text. I want to show you a couple of things. The Bible says he searched you. And he, now, if you go read the rest of this verse, you're going to find out why we should never abort a child ever. You go read it. The Bible says that he fashioned you when, before anyone even knew you. Before mom and dad knew they were pregnant, God was working in your life. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You searched me out, and you didn't just search, but you found me, and now you know me. He says, you understand my thought afar. You don't even understand your thoughts. Does anyone testify with me that you are baffled by the thoughts that roll through your head? You're like, whoa. I didn't say it out loud, did I? That was crazy. How many of you would be in the same prison I would be in if all your thoughts became action? Oh, my Lord, there would be a body piled up. <laughs> Usually associated with bikers or cats. I would be like scorched earth, man, in my head. You're like, you are a mess. I know, I know. But the Bible says you understand my thoughts. I just want to take a moment and tell God I'm really sorry <laughs> that you had to be exposed to my thoughts, Lord. <laughs> but he's acquainted with them. <clears throat> the Bible says that he understands your thoughts and he, comp and he comprehends your path. He comprehends your path. And he's acquainted with all your ways. Now, these are interesting words. The word comprehend, mean, it literally means to spread it out before you. He he he. he he, it's kind of like if, matter of fact, it means to fan out or to, to, to spread out. So when you go down the road and, like, I'm walking at the property and there's sagebrush everywhere, and I'm trying just to clear a path so people can walk up there and just pray or whatever. Well, I'm going through with a chainsaw. Well, God, I don't know how he does it, but he's going and clearing the path for me. So he's making my, ha my path uh, easier for me or understandable for me if I choose it. And then it says he is acquainted the, the word acquainted means to be a steward of something or to, uh, to, to show harmony with something. Remember we talked about harmony earlier with axios. <clears throat> and so he's acquainted with all my ways. That means that wherever I go, he's going with me. I feel like I need to apologize once more. And so <clears throat> beautiful, beautiful uh, text here. Then it says, if I go to heaven, you are there. Well, of course, we all know that. That's not a big surprise. But then he says, if I make my bed in hell. What? Number one, why would you make your bed in hell? Well, he's not talking about hell. He's talking about the pit. It's the word sheol. It can mean a number of different things. But one of the things it means is just a bad place or a bottom pit. <clears throat> and so I want you to get this picture, that you're walking down a trail. And someone has made a set of trap for you, and you've seen this in the movies, and it's just a trap. And when you fall in it, you fall all the way to the bottom. And when you hit the bottom, you hit thud. You hit dirt, right? <clears throat> well, the Bible says when you hit the bottom, guess what's at the bottom? His hands, like this. So no matter what the bottom of your life is, you can't get below God's hands. At the very bottom are his hands. And so... <clears throat> He knows you. He knows your thoughts. He knows your path. He knows your indiscretions. He knows the words that are on your tongue before you speak them. Oh, my God, help me. You are always, according to Jeremiah 29, 11, you're always on his mind. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. No matter what you think of yourself, no matter what your boss thinks about you or your in-laws think about you or your ex thinks about you, God thinks about you too. And when God thinks about you, he says, I don't have plans to hurt you. I have plans to prosper you and give you a future and a hope. <clears throat> And I got news for you. He thinks the same thing about your ex, so chill out. <laughs> You're always on his mind. There is not a moment in your existence that God's not thinking about you. I had somebody come to me one time. They said they were talking. 
my uh, it's a family. And so I wonder what my dog's thinking. He said, he's thinking about you all the time. That may be true. I don't know. I can't really get in a dog's head. I know a cat's thinking about how to sabotage my life. <laughs> if you're honest, you know I'm right. If you die, they'll eat your body. <laughs> I should have said that. Is this being recorded? I don't know if that's true, but I know this, that God's always thinking about me. He's always thinking about me. I'm always on his mind. And because he's God, he's thinking about you at the same time. And so when you get heavy and feel like garbage, just remember this, that God's thinking about you. And he doesn't think about you the same way you think about you. So maybe we ought to think about ourselves the way God thinks about us. By the way, if you want to be happily married, speak to the potential of your spouse. Anybody can pick all their flaws. That's easy. Any old coward can do that. That's low-hanging fruit. But speak to their potential, something you haven't even seen yet, and they may not even seen yet. Then you will progress and you'll grow, and your spouse will grow with you because they'll grow in that faith and that, re- that expectation. But I want you to see what God's thoughts do for you, especially in the area of of the pit because you have to understand something about God that God which this takes me to my next point God has a plan for you so he knows you he's invested in you and he has a plan for you I got to wrap this up quick I don't know if I can I'll try and his plan is not always uh some people say well the destiny of my life yeah you have a destiny for sure but here's the good news. When you do get off course and you do, do, do dumb things, and we all do, God has a plan to rescue you. You know, Delta Force is, uh, uh, all our special ops are amazing, but Delta Force is uniquely uh, uh, great at rescuing hostages. And so, all of them do it to some degree, but Delta Force has always been considered really, really good at it. It's kind of what they train for. Well, God's been doing this for a long time. And he knows how to reach into the darkness of someone's life and pull them off the brink of destruction and put them back on a path of righteousness if we let him. He, this is his specialty. It is, it's his character to rescue. He has a plan for your life, not only when you're doing well, but when you're doing bad. You may not have a plan. You may not understand his plan. And sometimes you may not like his plan. But his plan will always end in you being free. Daniel was in a lion's den, and he was set free. Shadrach and the boys were in a furnace, and they were set free. Elijah was in the midst of starvation because of famine, and he was set free. Joshua was in a pit, and he was set free. He was in the, uh, the prison as well. He was set free. The adulterous woman was in sin and ready to be executed, but she was set free. The woman with issue of blood was, had a terminal disease, and she was set free. And Jesus was set free from the tomb. So whatever situation you're in, God has a plan for you to rescue you. So I just don't know how it will happen. You don't have to know how it will happen. You just have to trust him that it will happen. And then you have to get your life directed and corrected to walk worthy. That's what we're talking about, of of this, this calling that God has in your life. And ultimately, the word saved. How many of you are saved in here? A good, about a quarter of you. The rest of you will have an altar call in just a minute, and I expect you to be here. Either that or you're a liar and you know it. How many of you are saved in here? Woo, more people got saved. Wow, that's amazing. Do you know where the word saved means sozo? Oh, excuse me. The word saved in Greek is sozo, and it means rescued. That's what it means. You're rescued. This is what God does. And so before you get all in the molly grubs and you know, all that kind of stuff, and you start whining and moping about, I don't have a job, or I got laid off, or I got divorced, or I got sick, or whatever. Just remember, God sent his son. The Bible says when the fullness of time had come, God sent, uh, uh, hatched this plan from the beginning and executed it in, in what we see in the Gospels, and, and, perf- and Jesus performed it to this day because his heart was sozo, to rescue so don't be surprised because God 
will rescue you. Don't be surprised by that at all. That's the reason you got saved to begin with, because you were lost and undone, and you need someone to rescue you. And it just so happens that sometimes we make foolish decisions, or life comes sideways, and we get tripped up. But the good news is that God is still in the rescuing business. And so you don't have to just resolve to be resolved to the fact that you're going to be defeated, or broke, or sick, or single, or lonely, or whatever. You can rise up and say, I'm not sure how it's going to happen. I'm not sure of his plan, but he's the planner. I'm the executor. All I got to do is walk this thing out. Once he shows me a way, I'm going to walk this thing out. And I'm going to come out of the darkness of my life into the light of his word. And I'm going to see God do great things in my life. Refuse to settle for darkness. Well, I'm just going to be lonely in my own life. No, don't be lonely. Go to life group. I'm going to be broke my whole life. No, you're not going to be broke. Just believe God for some wisdom and opportunity. And when the opportunity shows up, don't be lazy. You're going to be saved, not only eternally, but in this life. 